Spanish, they might, they might kick back. 192, 193, and 194. 192, 193, and 194. God moves in a mysterious way, His wonders Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, He treasures up His bright designs and works His gracious will. You fearful saints, fresh courage make the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by people's sins, but trust Him for His grace. Behind the frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan His work in vain. God is His own interpreter, and He will make it plain. Guide me, O Thou, great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing waters flow. Let the fiery, cloudy pillar lead me on my journey through. Strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, anxious fear subside, Bear me through the swelling current. Land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Guide me, O oh, the great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, bathe thou still my strength and shield. Still thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Bear me through the swelling current, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. I will ever give to thee. 267. 267. I'm 
tell us what we should do. Father, we thank you that he took that bread, which he said was his body, divided amongst them after giving thanks. He said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Father, we realize what Satan tries to teach is so inferior to what's truth. Father, we thank you that that bread to our minds is our Savior's body. Be with the ones we've taken tonight, Father, but help us all to remember how lucky and fortunate we are. It is in and through the name of Jesus we pray. thanks for what's in the cup Jesus said was his blood. Father, we thank you that to our minds that is exactly what we needed. We need the forgiveness of sins. And it was Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection through which we have the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for that third cup we look forward to taking that fourth cup one day when the kingdom is culminated at home. He anticipates for taking of it with us, and so do we, with him. Forgive us of our sins, please, and it's in Jesus we pray. Please mark 541. 541. When you have that mark, go the next to the last book of the Bible, and that's the book of Jude. The book of Jude. I, I wish I could tell you lot more than I already know. But I can only tell you what I know. I've been told that I'm supposed to be this smart guy and I'm like, I'm not any smarter than anybody else. They give me a hard time about the degrees I have and I told, like I told somebody yesterday, I just, it's just paper, three papers that satisfy the state. That's all I, all I care about. I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I try to get smarter every day, and the more I get smart, the more I find out Solomon's words are right. You feel more dumb every day. I wish I could tell you what happened between Mark chapter 6 and this book. You see, when you, you have the list of Jesus' family, and you get back to the book of Mark, you see a guy by the name of Judas. Now there are several Judases. We always associate the name Judas with only one. But one of those men is the half-brother of the Lord, and he's the author of this book. He's absolutely ashamed of his half-brother. In fact, Jesus would be considered to his family the black sheep of the family. They start asking the family about the, their brother, their son, and, and, and the family is so ashamed of him that they said, well, he's really not our brother. He's really not. I mean, you know, he, he says things, yeah, we know, and he does things, but he's really, you know, he's just out there. you got to understand, he, we, we'd say it something like this in 2020. You know, he's, he's a little off his rocker. you got to cut him a little bit of a break. And he would say things like, before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. He equivocally equaled himself with God, which was and he is. And his family turned his back on him. Mary kept the things and pondered the things in her heart. And I can't tell you 
what happened between that time and the book we're writing or reading right now. In fact, when you study the book of Jude, you use it for one standard. And that is, you use it for the standard that we talked about last Sunday night. The devil has not stopped keeping up teachers. Paul put it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they won't, they just won't accumulate teachers. They will heap teachers unto themselves to tell them what they want to hear. To, to, to only tickle their itching ears. Do you realize it's impossible to tickle or to tickle the ears while you're trying to cure the itch for it? They don't mix. That was Paul's point. And when you come to Jude, he says things and you're just like, wow. I mean, Paul does great. I, we give Paul a lot of credit, and we should. Peter did great. Peter did some things that we sometimes don't always consider as great as Paul, and we shouldn't do that, but we do. And yet when you get the two brothers, the half-brothers of the Lord, the one that wrote the book of James, and the one that wrote this one, and you, you just, where did the conversion take place? I can't help but think it took place at Pentecost. I may be wrong. I can't prove that because when you've got two million people that are in Jerusalem and you've got everybody listening to the gospel in their own language with 12 men, how does that work? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, that's how that works. That's the only way it can work. God's the only one that can do that. And what he says in the first part of this book, we're only going to cover a little bit of it tonight, and what the Bible continues to tell us we need to keep putting, we need to keep heaping this on ourselves. And the reason we need to keep heaping it on ourselves is because we get this sun in our heart and the devil comes along and he takes and he unravels the stitch. He unravels the string. And so then we, oh man, we're, we're doing good on Sunday night or we're doing good on Monday and then by Tuesday we're back to the, oh, woe is me. Oh, 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 oh. I've told this before, but let me tell it for those who haven't heard it. I wrote a song. I wrote a great country song. I'm surprised it hadn't been on the radio yet. And it goes something like this. Nobody cares about me today. Nobody. I based it on Psalm 142.5. Come on. Nobody cares about me. And so I'm singing that song going around. And then my four-year-old daughter starts going, nobody cares. Nobody cares. You know what I almost did? I almost thanked her. You have a mom and dad that loves you. You got a grandma and a grandma. You got a grandma and you got a meat mom and you got a papa that loves you dead. And then I went, wait a minute, where'd she learn that song? Where'd she learn that song? She didn't learn that song from the radio. She didn't learn that song because she wrote it. She wrote it saying because her daddy taught her. And if we will get the words just a verse one, we're going to go a little further. Don't panic. But first of all, we're slaves. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. Paul put it another way in Romans chapter 6. We are slaves to someone or something. You cannot be free other than being in Christ Jesus. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine because if you present yourself slave, whatever you present or whom, to whomever you present yourself slave to obey, that's who you obey. And he says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, th this is very, very significant in that Look at the way Jude viewed himself before, whenever it was. I'm not saying it was Pentecost. I'm just guessing. 
but imagine what he's saying now. Because he couldn't stand his brother. I mean, he had such a disdain for his brother. The only reason he tolerated his brother being around is because Jesus supported the family. Joseph had been dead for about 12 years before Jesus resumed his ministry, or assumed his ministry. And when he says that, he's saying, I am a slave of my older physical brother, but more importantly, I'm a slave of my Savior. Now here's the great part. The best master to have is Jesus Christ. He's the best master to ever have because what has he done? He first of all loved us. Second, he died for us. Third of all, he still makes intercession for us. He does that to this day. Hebrews 7.25 and when Jude says he's the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, not the there are three Jameses in the in the New Testament. The one that he's speaking of is the one that wrote the book of James, the half brother of the Lord. I don't know when he obeyed either. But you talk about two guys that just make practical common sense. James is probably the first New Testament book written, and it's written with one thing in mind: common sense. It's amazing how people don't have any common sense anymore. And I've read stuff ever since back with uh, Socrates that this is the same complaint that people have. One guy put on Facebook the other day, has anything really changed? I started writing back, hey, go back and ask Socrates what he thought of, of the world. And it's the same thing. We complain about the things that they complained about in 1100 and 1200. And when he says he's a slave, he wants to talk to some people. He wants to talk to you and me. Now, who are we? Number one, we're called. Oh, I know there are people that love to abuse this word. And I know sometimes you get tired of hearing about false teaching and all this stuff. But, folks, the devil hasn't stopped teaching us falsely yet. Don't ever forget that. He is still throwing things at us to this day. He's throwing things at us right now. And we've got to make sure that we are who we are, not who we think we are. Because Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, I test the heart, God says, and the heart's deceitful. Sometimes we get too big for ourselves. Sometimes we get too small for ourselves, Romans 12, 3. And when you look at this, he says, we're the called. Now, wait just a second. Called by what? The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 and 14, that this is what calls us. This is what calls us. Now, why is it that we have people today... Or why is it that we have other denominations growing out of one particular denomination? It is because that one denomination told their people they could not, they were forbidden from reading the Bible because the Bible is only for preachers. And when they read the Bible, when they started reading the Bible, they went, you know what, what we've been doing for years is wrong. What we've been doing is wrong. We need to get back to what God said to do. And they realized they were called. It's not one of these, oh, I was out in the way, I used to listen to the People's Court, or, yeah, People's Court years ago. And, and the, the, these guys would always say, well, see, I was out in Wheatfield one day, and, and uh, man, I passed out, and the Lord talked to me in a vision. And he says, you need, this is how you need to be saved. That guy's a liar. Well, how do you prove that? I proved that very well. But if, if Jesus would not tell the apostle Paul how to be saved, he's not going to tell you and me how to be saved. That's not Jesus' responsibility. That's our responsibility. And you can look at the same thing in Acts chapter 10. 
And yet the devil is going to use anybody, anything, any means to try to get to us. And secondly, he says we are the sanctified. We talked about this this morning. We're set apart. We are a unique people. In fact, Peter uses that word. We are a special people. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Peculiar to himself. That's who we are. We are the called and we are the sanctified. But we're not called. We're not sanctified because we decided one day to pick up the phone. We are called by God. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. What's the difference? I know a lot of people that think they got to do things. And you listen, you listen to enough preaching, sounds like that's what we're saying, that you've got to do things. Well, you do. But let me ask you a question. Who has done more to save you and me? Us or God? You know the answer to that question. In comparison, he has asked us to do very, very little. But as we talked about this morning, if you took me to Texas Roadhouse, and you ordered me that porterhouse that they have down there, and it comes to the table, and I go, oh, that looks good. What am I supposed to do with that? You're going to go, yeah, I, I know you. I, I can see you. you I can see your, your old gut. I know you know what to do with that. No, I don't know what to do with it. And then you turn around and say, well, you eat it. Are you kidding me? I don't. I'm not eating a porterhouse. I'll eat a ribeye, but not a porterhouse. See, I'll use the Krispy Kreme. I'll eat a ribeye, but I'm not going to eat a porterhouse. Well, you'd be so insulted, mad. What in the world? A porterhouse costs more than a ribeye. What in the world are you thinking? What costs more? Jesus to die for us? Or for us to live for him. You know which one costs more. To die for him. And so when he ascended back to the Father, he left these men, these 12 men, and then subsequently other men to warn us about things that are happening today. Because he talks about three things here. And I will tell you that members of the church, I've, just, I've experienced this. I know somebody doesn't believe me, but I've experienced this. Members of the church do not believe you should preach this. In fact, I preached on verses 20 to 25, which eventually we'll get to one of these days, Lord willing. And a la two ladies in the congregation said, if he keeps preaching like that, we're going to fire him. I said, guess what? Fire me, because it's the truth. It's the truth. If I get fired for preaching the truth, I'm proud. I'll be upset, but I'll be proud. Because I don't know to this day what they were upset about. Except they didn't know what those three things are. Mercy. In each of the verses of Psalm 136, the psalmist writes, His mercy endures forever. This is one of the greatest understatements of all time. How merciful is God? <laughs> Extremely. He had every right to wipe Israel off the face of the map in Numbers 14. You see, it was bad, it was bad that they said God lied to us. They didn't say it in those words, I know, but that's what they said. And then they go and they try to do a makeup mission. And when Moses says, don't even try, you're going to fail, what they do? They did it anyway. How about in Joshua chapter 6 when they stole things that belonged to God? And in Joshua 7, they go, I mean, Joshua says, Joshua writes and he says, man, this is going to be an easy deal. This is AI. And what happens? They get, they get all the way back to the camp with their tail up between their legs because they got whooped. 
I mean severely whooped. Josh was on his face. And he's crying and saying, God, why would you bring us out here to do this? God says, shut up. There's sin in the camp. They found out what happened. They took Achan and his family, stoned them to death, and then burned them with fire. And then Joshua did what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to have asked God in the first place. He didn't even ask God. Shall we take AI? Oh, you will soundly defeat AI. It didn't take anything for him to defeat AI. You get to Joshua 24 and verse 15 in his valedictory address. He says, I know what you're going to do. Choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods on this side, on the other side of the river or the gods in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. They say, oh, far be it from us that we serve anybody else but God. And he says, you're a witness against yourself because you get to the very next chapter, Judges chapter 1, and what do they do? They sold themselves into sin. So they get taken by the Midianites. Or the Moabites, sorry. God selects a judge by the name of Deborah and a soldier by the name of Barak. And he delivers them. And they start serving God. And then what do they do? They do it again. And so God lets the Midianites take them for 20 years. And finally he says to a guy by the name of Gideon, it's time to deliver them. And then Gideon has doubts of whether or not he's supposed to. And God is so merciful and so merciful and so merciful. Can you imagine if we had been watching the encounter on Mount Sinai with God and Moses, what that would have been like on CNN or Fox? I mean, Moses has an excuse for everything. I don't think I would have been as patient with Moses as God was. Maybe I would have. I don't know. But I know I would have made as many excuses as Moses did. <laughs> Who am I? I can't talk. I can't, I can't do those things you're asking me to do. That isn't where God got mad at him. It's when he said get somebody else to do it. And then he almost lost his life because he refused to, sac to, to circumcise his son. He forgot about that one. Zipper of his wife's safety. Because what God wants is he wants peace. See, we have peace. Verse, Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. We have peace with God our Father. But we don't have peace with God our Father because we earned it. It is because we have been granted mercy. And that last one is the word love. We use, we use the word love, and there are, there are eight, Greek language, eight Greek words for love, but let me remind you of four of them. The first one that we use is the word eros. That is only the love exists between a husband and a wife. It's erotic love. The third one is, store, is, is phileo love. That is the love that we have, you know, kids call me homie a lot of times. Friends, Philadelphia, that's where we get that idea. Second is storge love. That's the love that you have for your family. My mom is very dear to me. My, my brother-in-law is very dear to me. My brothers are very dear to me. I love them to death. That's not the word here. The word here is agapio, or we call it traditionally agape love. And what it simply means is a love that we control, that we determine. Now we don't put up barriers. A lot of people don't love because they have barriers. God can't even tear them down. Well, he could, but he's not going to. And, and this is the love of which he speaks that, you know what? There had to be love involved in this, in this plan of salvation. Would you want to empty yourself of the perfect place to live? Would you want to come 
to a place in which you're going to be spit upon, beaten, mistreated, misaligned. Would you want any of that? No. And then, would you want to die for a people who said, you deserve more than you got. You got off scot-free. No, you wouldn't. But Jesus did. Jesus did because of that enormous, enormous love. And he doesn't say, let it be with you. Let it be multiplied to you. Now, how in the world are we going to do that? Verse 3 explains that. I only want to cover the first part of it tonight. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. That's all I want to address tonight in this lesson. We'll come back to it, Lord willing, next week. You see, you and I have a salvation. You and I have a salvation. Now that big word simply means to be saved from something. And Romans 5, 9 tells us what that is. The wrath of God. I don't know what that's going to be completely like, but I know it's going to be at least in the, in the realm of three senses. Number one, it's going to be in the sense of hearing. This is the noisiest town in the United States. I, I'm telling you, there are people at 5.30 this morning, the dogs were barking. I thought they would turn into roosters. I don't know. I, the, the people are, are doing what they got to do, and I'm glad they get to do it. I'm glad they have a job. But it is so noisy. And there are times when the noise is so bad that you just go, does anybody go to sleep? Sometimes I have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the funeral home to do a, a call. And, and I just get amazed as to how many people are driving between here and Silver. It's just 2 o'clock in the morning, there's 12, 15 cars going back and forth, and you're like, what are you doing? Which technically is none of my business, but it just always has my curiosity. We want peace. And the only way we can have that is through salvation. But I want to remind you of something. When you read the book of Revelation in chapter 8, when you read the book of Revelation, period, you find out something about heaven. I grew up believing. I grew up teaching and preaching. And I grew up with the idea that heaven is this calm place. Oh, that we just float around. Not necessarily on clouds, but, you know, we float around. And we, we just are going to have such a tranquil time. It's just going to be so peaceful. It's going to be so this and that. You know what? I tried to find that. And Revelation chapter 8 says, the only thing that stopped the noise of heaven prayers and saints. Now why 30 minutes? I don't know. Maybe we'll get back to that study one day. But heaven is the most organized, chaotic, noisiest place in the universe. It's not noisy because we're not going to like it. It's noisy because we're going to love every minute of it. It's going to be praise for whom? God. It's going to be praise for God. I wish I could tell you how many Christian friends that there were brothers and sisters in Christ would tell me, you need to stop singing so loud because nobody can hear you or nobody can sing while you sing that loud. I wish they could tell you God's not in One time I, my throat was so bad I couldn't sing. I, I was so oh, oh. And so I was humming. And a friend of mine, Christian brother, 
said, God's not interested in your humming. What I should have told him was, God wasn't interested in your silence either. But I let him get the best of me and let the devil get the best of me, and I went home boo-hooing. See, God doesn't look at what you and I look at. What do you remind Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7? He looks at the heart. And I know a lot of people that will tell you, look you right in the eye and go, you know, we sound so terrible. We sound so horrible at our singing. To whom? I asked a friend of mine this one time. I said, to whom do you sound terrible? He said, what do you mean? I said, you said you sound terrible. I thought you were there to sing praises to God. And he says, well, I don't know what you you said you sound terrible. To whom do you sound terrible? Then he looked a little bit and he says, to us. I didn't think you were there because of what you wanted. I thought you were there because you wanted what God wanted. Then he resorted to ridiculing me and ridiculing the church. He's gone now. I wonder, I wonder if he didn't have some regrets right when he died. Not because I'm better. The, the, look, I want you to go home knowing this. I'm not any better than anybody else. Sometimes the truth hurts, yes, but I want you to know, I want everybody to go home. The reason is, is because this, this became so powerful to me. We were, in 1987, my Uncle Chauncey died. My Uncle Chauncey was an elder in the church. 24, 25 years, whenever Chauncey spoke, the other elders listened. That's kind of man he was. It wasn't because he was arrogant. He was just God. And he, his health had got the best of him. He was on dialysis twice a week, so he'd go to Bible study on Wednesday night. It just, it just knocked him out. When he died, I remember we we stayed for the funeral and then we stayed for church. And my dad walked out of that building and you'd have thought that he was high as a kite. And I mean on something illicit. And I we got in the vehicle to go back to Aunt Norma's house. He said, Did you hear that? I mean, he didn't say hello. He didn't say everybody ready and help me. Did you hear that? Uh, uh, he, uh, what are you talking about? He said, did you hear that? Did you hear what we did this morning? And I said, yeah, the lesson was, oh, yeah, the lesson was fine. Okay. Um, hear that. And he's just doing this. And I said, I said, what are you talking about? He said, did you hear that singing? I said, oh yeah, we got to sing songs we had not sang in 10 years. Salvation has been brought down to glory. How I love the great Redeemer. We belted it out. But that isn't what my dad finished that with. He looked at me and he says, can't you imagine what heaven's going to sound like? With 1,400 people there, can you imagine what heaven is going to sound like with more than 1,400 people? I don't know what we're going to sing. I don't know what we're, what's involved there because God didn't tell us. But we're going to find out if we're His and remain faithful to Him. Until the day we die. Would you take your song books, please, and turn to 541. If you're here this evening, and we can help you in your walk with the Lord, please let us do that as we sing. Prince of peace, control my will, bid this struggling heart be still, bid my fears and doubts my spirit into peace. 
Thou hast bought me with thy blood. Open wide the gate of God. Peace I ask, but peace must be. Savior, at thy feet I fall, thou my life, my God, my all. Let thy happy servant be one forevermore with thee. Amen. After we sing the first verse of 542, Patrick, will you please dismiss us, sir? Your Thank y'all for being here tonight.